So what we're going to do is instead of just taking an object and dividing it into a collection of points as we just did, we're going to look at how we might be able to get creative with points and, create, and construct our own sequence. We're going to do that by looking at one of the sequence objects in Grasshopper called range. Now if we jump over here into Grasshopper, we can see that under the sets menu, where we were looking at list, we also have a submenu called sequence. And in the sequence submenu, there are a bunch of different objects that allow us to create a sequence of values or letters or patterns to remove things as well as random values. In this case, we're going to look at the range object. Now I'm just going to delete all the geometry that I have in Rhino. And we'll just start fresh here. Now the range objects object creates a sequence of numbers equally spaced inside a numeric domain. So a domain is really just a numeric, uh, sorry, rather a no numeric domain is the space that's actually defined between two numeric extremes. Does anyone know what another term for minimum and maximum is when we're talking about domains? You can just post it right into your message window and we'll just pull the group really quick. Awesome. So yeah, minimum is sometimes referred to as floor. Sometimes it's referred to, uh, rather minimum is referred to as floor. You also have maximum, which is sometimes referred to as ceiling. Extremes is another way to think about those things. Well, what that looks like is something like this. A domain here, you can see between zero and one, is really a space. The range takes that space, depending upon a number of steps, as you can see at the top, and divides it up into segments. That's very similar to what um, we did whenever we divided the curve. We took a curve and we divided it into a set of equal length segments. That resulted in points. The range works in a very similar way. So let's jump over to Grasshopper really quick and take a look at the two inputs here, D and N. What is D asking for? Now feel free to always just go ahead and post a, a reply to the message um, if you'd like. But you can see here that you can mouse over D and it'll give you a pop-up. And it says the domain of numeric range. So this is exactly that. This is the space that we're talking about. If I drop in a slider, for instance, I can connect that to D. And dropping in a panel, take a look at what's coming out of the range. Here you'll notice that the domain, D, is between 0 and 0 0.25. The first value in our list is 0, and the last one is 0 0.25. n is equal to 10. So if you notice, n equal to 10 is 10 steps. Here in our list, we have 11 values. A list always starts at zero. So even though the last item in the list is 10, you have to account for zero. So that's actually 11 total values. We can drop in another number slider, double clicking its name, changing it to integers. We could set the minimum value to one and say the maximum value to 40. 
with one step, we have two values, 0 and 0 0.25. Increasing this, you'll see that we have more values, but the start and end are fixed. So let's look at how we can use that in a creative and interesting way. We're going to use points and continue with points, but go a little bit further with them. So points are represented by an ordered set of numbers called coordinates. Most likely they're Cartesian in nature, but there are other ways for us to define them. Now they are one of the most basic geometrical elements. And because of that, they typically serve as the underlay for generating more complex geometric types. Since they can easily be generated from, a lot of times they're dependent upon other more complex geometric types as well. Now they reside within a specific coordinate system. That's what's referred to as a space. Typically, this is the world, or XYZ, Cartesian coordinate system. Here you can see the XY plane, and a point in world space being defined as X, Y, and Z. So what about creating a sequence of points that look like this? Well, this is really quite interesting, because what it allows us to do is to take a look at something like the trigonometric curve sign and understand how a point can be created from a sequence of values that are changing. Now if we remember from trig, sine, or the sine curve, is represented by taking t as x and sine of t as y. So you can see here the deflection of this set of points and resulting curve and y is a byproduct of taking the current value of t multiplied by sine. So let's go over here. I'm going to delete my panel, and I'm going to take the output of my range and use it to define the t value. So I will use it to define x. From my vector menu, I want to construct a point by x, y, and z. If I drop down my point, you can see that now I have an access to x, y, and z. So I can easily take my range value, which can also be understood. I'm going to label this, edit, group as t into x. I now have a sequence of points along x where y is equal to 0, z is equal to 0, but the current x position is equal to t, or the values coming out of my range. If I'd like to see a greater amount or greater distance covered, I can increase the value here in my slider. And if I would like to see a greater amount of points, I can increase the number here. So then, this is a really interesting effect. But what we'd like to do is see if we can't deform this set of points in Y. Going to our math tab, we can see that there is a whole lot of really interesting objects that we can use. This probably looks familiar, domain, because we've been working with domain already with our range object. We also have operators that we can use, addition, multiplication, equality, etc. And we also have ways to write our own expressions, work with polynomials, utilities, and in this case, from trig, we can grab sine. So if you remember, y equals the sine of t. If we take t into sine, 
and sine into y, we now have a sine curve. One side note is to transition from this sine curve into a three-dimensional curve like the helix is really quite easy to do so long as you know that z in a helix is equal to the cosine of t. In this case, the sine is y and the cosine is z. It's really quite easy to begin to get some pretty dynamic form here just by introducing one more step in the processing occurring in our algorithmic approach. If you change this maximum to say 200, you'll see you get a lot more points now. This really represents the fidelity in which the solution is being calculated. A collection of points is really great, but how about a curve passing through those points? Let's go to the curve menu. Instead of the primitive line, let's grab a spline. In this case, a curve. Dropping that into my canvas, I'll take the output of this point into V to now construct a curve. Now this is where managing previews becomes very, very important. If you notice, we have multiple previews on the points and the curve. If you'd like to only see the points, you can right click on the point icon and turn the preview off. Now we just see the curve. One thing to note is that if we turn the preview back on, you'll notice that below preview is an option called enabled. If I click enabled, you'll notice that this object is no longer viewable in Rhino, but it's also no longer being computed. The wire has now changed to a different color, and the object here, which is referred to as downstream from this object, is now orange as well. It is not receiving data from this object anymore, and therefore it's missing something it needs to be able to calculate a solution. Right-clicking on the icon again, I can enable it back on, and this will now be able to compute. So preview manages the preview on and off. Enabled is a kill switch to fully disable the computing of an object. Very important distinction. Let's go to File New.